Funding for Expedition Florida Wild Alachua was provided by a grant from the Alachua County Visitors and Convention Bureau, home to the University of Florida, where the pristine beauty of old Florida and the space-age knowledge of the 21st century meet. Additional support was provided by Forever Florida and Florida Echo Safaris, offering visitors guided nature tours on comfortable coaches or horseback. Forever Florida's mission is to preserve our unique wilderness habitats and natural beauty. And by G. Coffrin. I've been a photographer in North Central Florida since 1973 when I moved to Gainesville to attend the University of Florida. And it was shortly after moving here that I came to discover what an incredible playground the area is for a natural history photographer. Marjorie Canan Rawlings was an extremely complex individual, so th there's no way to uh, caricature her. Uh, at one minute she can be um, the consummate artist, and the next minute she's in a tirade. Well this site's a currently dry sinkhole that has an amazing uh, amount of chert outcropping around the edges of it. It's been used prehistorically for at least 11,000 years. Uh, beginning in the summer of 1539, we have a European history. Uh, it was that summer that Hernando de Soto and his expedition marched through Alachua County on their way uh, to North Florida and beyond. Exploration on Earth is pretty much done in the sense that we've seen almost every corner of the planet. And here in North Florida, we have one of the largest labyrinths of unexplored cave systems on Earth. And right here in the Alachua County area, we have these amazing systems. And we haven't even gotten to the tip of the iceberg. One of the nicest bike rides around is from Gainesville to, on the road to Williston. Brings you through wide open pasture country, through some very nice live oak hammocks, past a few archaeological sites similar to this one here. Look at the, look at the chert, chert all over the place. Lots of chert. This site has, is a sinkhole that's been dry now for a while, but has been used prehistorically by people since the first Floridians arrived 11,000 years ago. This is actually a swanee point that was found here that has been extensively resharpened. You can see where it tapers right in, right in the middle. It was hafted onto a spear and they didn't like the edge and rejuvenated it by making it a little bit narrower and a little bit sharper. And for whatever reason, it was discarded here. Probably made a new one right here. Well, there have been hundreds of beautiful points found at this site. Uh, this one's about eight or 9,000 years old. It's yes. called uh, Kirk Serrated. I'm going to try to replicate a point similar to that out of this piece of stone. First I'm going to dress the edge a little bit with hammer stone and I'll prepare an edge and I'll grind it a little bit. Okay, I ground the edge to prepare it for, for striking off larger flakes. Uh, being a flint napper, I like to find rock that really works well, that I can make replicas out of. I've done a lot of studies on trying to find out what was done in the past, and that's been one of my goals, is to see what the ancient people were trying to do. Well, when I was a child, I was seven years old, I found an original artifact, and that's what got my interest up. And I immediately began to try to understand how they made those things. I began to chip rocks. 
so by the time I was 12 years old, I could make a serviceable projectile point. Uh, for at least 11, maybe 12,000 years, American Indians were here. And then, uh, beginning in the summer of 1539, we have a European history. Uh, it was that summer that Hernando de Soto and his expedition marched through Alachua County on their way uh, to North Florida and beyond. And indeed, uh, they seem to have followed a trail, State Road 121, Williston Road, that comes right around Payne's Prairie on up, uh, goes on to the north, uh, all the way past Devil's Mill Hopper, a little bit to the west, on up into northwest Alachua County. De Soto, of course, landed on the southeast side of Tampa Bay and then marched north. The Indians there, I think, wanted to get rid of him, and they said, if you go to this town called Cali, uh, you'll find lots of food there. Well, De Soto needed to find a base, so he marched up to this town of Cali, which was probably in southwestern uh, Marion County. Uh, but when they got there, you know, in 20 minutes, they'd eaten everything in the village. Uh, and so he realized they had to move on and find another place. So he took about 50 cavalry uh, and about uh, 60 infantrymen and then marched north, sort of a lightning uh, scout trip up into Alachua County to these towns. We call the Indians who lived in Alachua County in 1539 the Potano Indians. P-O-T-A-N-O. -O. They were Temucuan speakers, and there were villages literally all over the place uh, in areas where there were good soil. They were farmers. They grew corn, beans, squash. Uh, but can you imagine, uh, Alachua County was home to possibly as many as 10,000 Indians. Uh, these villages that uh, were along this trail that he went through, uh, he interacted with them. One of the things he, he and his uh, people talk about are the extensive agricultural fields and uh, that's how they fed themselves. They went into the villages and took the stored corn and the other food that the Indians had. We've excavated some of their houses in southern Alachua County near Orange Lake. We know they were about uh, 20 feet across. They were round. They put big posts in the ground and then bend them over. Uh, one of the accounts from the Spanish period says that the houses looked a little like pyramids, I think, because they bent them over, tied them at the top, put the thatch on them. We have at the museum a lot of the artifacts that we've excavated from Potano Indian sites and from the sites of their pre-Columbian ancestors. I've been a photographer in North Central Florida since 1973 when I moved to Gainesville to attend the University of Florida. And it was shortly after moving here that I came to discover what an incredible playground the area is for a natural history photographer. I love being alone with my cameras on the basin of the great Alachua Savannah, as Bartram referred to it. There's thousands and thousands of acres where there's no telling what you're going to run into on any given day. I like to photograph on Noonan's Lake near my home, where I have lived for almost 25 years now. Noonan's Lake is perhaps the largest lake in Florida, certainly the largest I know of, so near an urban center as Gainesville that has escaped fairly unscathed. My work is published almost every day in the Gainesville Sun. Additionally, my work has been published in Life and Sierra and Smithsonian, the New York Times Magazine. National Geographic and on the cover of the Audubon Society Field Guide to Florida. I don't consider myself to be um, a bird ph photographer specifically, but uh, I do enjoy photographing larger species, the egrets, the herons, the cranes, the ospreys. Um, I'm particularly fond of photographing uh, birds uh, as part of a waterscape, so that they're just a figure in the landscape. Well, Alachua County is just a, a great place to see birds, birds of all kinds. A lot of people think that you have to go along the coasts of Florida to have great bird watching, but Alachua County proves that wrong. We have a big variety of wetlands in Alachua County, ranging from lakes and ponds and sinkholes, swamps, marshes. That brings in a lot of birds. Alachua County has a number of great places to uh, watch birds. If I had to pick three or four or five of the best places, I think number one would be Payne's Prairie. Uh, it's a seven or 8,000 acre wetland just immediately south of Gainesville itself. Uh, it varies on how wet it is from year to year, but any, any season of the year, they're great birds to see out in Payne's Prairie. Payne's Prairie is something real to hold on to in a world all broken out with man. We can thank Archie Carr for that great quote. I love the prairie. There have been so many wonderful experiences I've had chasing the light, photographing rainbows and sandhill cranes and alligators at dusk with their eyes glowing and the ephemeral bloom of 
the American lotus, which blossomed perhaps once every 20 years in profusion on the Prairie Basin. It's a place that has many wonderful qualities that are easily missed at 60 miles an hour as you blaze across 441 or the interstate. We also have great upland habitats, nice forests like San Falasco Hammock uh, or Devil, Devil's Millhopper, where we are today. Uh, so Alachua County has uh, all the good terrestrial habitats, the good aquatic habitats that really bring in a, a, a good variety of, of bird life. This is one of the most unique environments in all of Alachua County. This is a gigantic sinkhole that has collapsed. This is uh, home to fossils coming out of the walls, testimony to the fact that this area was covered by marine sediments in the millions of years ago in the distant geological past. Uh, you can visit the Devil's Mill Hopper and uh, go back in time as you descend the stairs to the waterfalls in the bottom of the uh, sinkhole, and you can understand how uh, Florida is really a porous structure that is underlain by caverns and groundwater plays such an important part of defining this state. The waterfall is so comfortable and settling. You can hear it from here probably right now, and it's also so pretty and pristine. The water is so clean. It's amazing coming down the rocks. It's really beautiful here. It's very peaceful. Water is so important in Florida. Florida is surrounded by water, and water runs through Florida. It runs over it, but more importantly, it runs through Florida. Alachua County has thus far largely escaped the, uh, the development that has so transfigured the landscape of South Florida. And it is a place yet rich in the abundant gifts of nature and provides an incredible array of opportunities for photographers who are looking for the experience of capturing on film much of what's left of the original natural Florida. Well, the McGuire Center represents probably the foremost center for butterfly and moth research in the world. So it, it really is the focus for researchers coming to the U.S., uh, studying here for students that want to become entomologists or lepidopterists someday, and for the general public to come and and become better educated about butterflies and moths and the environment overall. So I think it, it's, a, it's a really a key addition to the University of Florida. And to have something like this in the backyard of Gainesville is just a really a, a wonderful opportunity. We are leading the way on several endangered species projects, both here in Florida and in the Caribbean, around the world. So we're really innovating the field of butterfly conservation. Wire Center collections here of Lepidopter are, are really very, very important and unparalleled uh, because they're more recently uh, collected material. They're in much better condition than a lot of material that's in a lot of the major museum collections, such as the British Museum of Natural History and the American Museum. Well, well, butterflies play really important roles in the environment. One is their food for a lot of other organisms. But more importantly nowadays is they become very good icons for conservation, pretty much like the colorful, fuzzy, Mega vertebrate used to be, they've become this uh, wonderful identity for why should we conserve certain areas. And many butterflies are also important as biological indicators because they go through their life very, very quickly. They react to changes in the environment. So they're essentially like our canary in the coal mine. At the McGuire Center, we hope to inspire children, the general public, everyone to take an active role in conserving our environment. And we do this through the vehicle of butterflies. We hope that people, once they come to the Butterfly Rainforest and the McGuire Center, have a better appreciation of the natural world around them. We basically want to use butterflies as tools to educate them about why the environment is important and why people should care about it. Cross Creek is a bend in a country road by land, and the flowing of Loch Lusa Lake into Orange Lake by water. We are four miles west of the small village of Island Grove, nine miles east of a turpentine still, and on the other sides, we do not count distance at all, for the two lakes and the broad marshes create an infinite space between us and the horizon. When people ask me what, what it's like to, to be recreating the author of The Yearling here, here at Cross Creek, I, I can only say that it's a, it's a very humbling experience because this is arguably Florida's greatest author. Who owns Cross Creek? The Redbirds, I think, more than I, for they will have their nests, even in the face of delinquent mortgages. Oh, I'm tired. I stayed up way past midnight. Way past midnight. Well, there was a, 
there was a, some kind of ruckus. I don't know what it was, but uh, I hope we get some wind today. I don't know. The grove and the garden were, were survival to Marjorie, particularly after it became clear that she wasn't going to uh, be able to make a living as a writer right away. Cookery is my one vanity, and I am a slave to any guest who praises my culinary art. The new foods that I found in Florida were a challenge, and I have learned more about cookery in my years at the Creek than in those that preceded them. Marjorie Canan Rollins was an extremely complex individual, so there's no way to uh, caricature her. Uh, at one minute, she can be um, the consummate artist, and the next minute, she's in a tirade. The house is very important because her, her spirit lives here to a certain degree. Welcome to Marjorie Rawlings' farm. This is where the author did her writing. She put in 8 to 12 hour long days when she was working on a novel sometimes calling writing a painful discipline. She had 72 acres on the farm and had over 3,000 citrus trees. First, you have to understand that Marjorie didn't intend for this place to be a museum. She left it to the University of Florida, and it's only been in fairly recent history that it's become open to the public. And so um, the, the parts that we can um, s s most see her in are, are the little touches, the, uh, her writing table that her first husband made for her. The fact that there's no gift shop here is one of my favorite parts. The fact that there are no plastic alligators sold out of the kitchen door. And one would hope that that would always remain. Florida is, is not a, a destination, it's a journey. And for Rawlings especially, it, was, uh, it wasn't some place that she arrived to uh, all of all her travels, intellectually, emotionally, and as a, as a serious writer, began here. Cross Creek belongs to the wind and to the rain, to the sun and the seasons, to the cosmic secrecy of sea, and beyond all, to time. The Dudleys operated this farm through three generations, pre-Civil War to the 1980s when uh, Myrtle Dudley, the last of the 12 children, donated this farm to the Florida Park Service. It's unique in that it's not a recreation, it's an original, authentic, working Florida farm and there really is not another one like it in the state. Ah. These cattle that we have here are the Florida cracker cows and they're descendants from the original cows that were brought in in 1521 from the explorations when Ponce de Leon came to Florida. Uh, the cattle that we have were actually brought in from Kissimmee State Park, uh, and so their herd, and along with Payne's Prairie's herd, are pretty wild. So that makes ours pretty unique, that, that you can get close to them and, and actually touch them. Uh, mules were used in the south, and specifically on Dudley Farm, uh, because they could take the heat. Uh, the syrup was harvested in the fall, using the mules to help haul the cane stalks into the cane mill. The mules would be hitched to the sweep, which connects to the mill, and they would grind the cane, usually taking about two hours to grind cane into juice, ready to boil. The house garden is a seasonal vegetable garden. Uh, the Dudleys grew carrots, onions, potatoes, uh, especially sweet potato was an important crop. Uh, so we try to grow the heirloom vegetables. Well, the Dudleys were able to live to almost totally off the land and um, didn't depend on other resources but themselves. And uh, something we've found is how labor intensive that work was. Well, Dudley Farm is of particular interest to me as a preservation architect because it's a wonderful example of vernacular architecture in Florida in the late 19th century. Most of the materials that were used in this building were obtained locally but the main thing was that the heat of the day would soon be lost in the wood construction, in the shingle roof, in the attic, 
and the house would cool off nicely in the evening. Uh, the work that has been put into bringing back the buildings to their original configurations, to figuring out exactly how all of the property was used, bringing back the aura of the original entrance to this place. It's just a remarkable transformation in the last few years. Well, I think all you have to do is come out here and visit the farm and it will become very obvious to you the value of preserving something like this. Visitors uh, to Dudley Farm Historic State Park can learn about a simpler way of life and a self-sustaining, uh, self-sufficient lifestyle, um, how people made a living um, before technology, and maybe take a little bit of that with them to apply to their modern lives. From the first Spanish explorers to the exploration of outer space, Florida has played a key role in understanding natural history, uh, cultural history, and exploration. The Florida Museum of Natural History has one of the great traditions in vertebrate paleontology. In the area, we have many rich sites where students and volunteers and visitors can work with us in paleontological excavations. And this is a whale vertebra from Devil's Ear, a deep cavern way back in the Santa Fe River. And the museum is going to excavate more of this. So far, we just have one vertebra of this very large whale. But we need to go back in this deep underwater cavern with Wes Skiles to get the rest of it where he first discovered it back in the 70s. From here, we can go up the Santa Fe River. I can show you some of the most beautiful fossil country in the world. People who have very little background can easily explore, especially in some of our beautiful, pristine river systems. It's a perfect day for it. Let's go. We have some of the richest natural history sites, uh, paleontological sites. We have underground water systems and many different landscapes. We have a wealth of fossil sites in the Santa Fe River where people every year make new discoveries of extraordinary importance. So for the explorer, this area holds untold promise of, of discoveries that people can't even imagine. You know, one of the really amazing things about underwater cave exploration is you just simply never know what you're going to find. Uh, in the 70s, we were diving through a very sinuous labyrinth of tunnels in the Devil's Ear cave system. And we came into a room. Here I saw this black shapes, these black circular objects sticking literally out of the wall. And I said, what on earth is that? Well, this is, um, this is what we saw at first. You know, we were swimming into the passageway and I looked and saw this bizarre pattern that was very un-limestone like and we knew it was time to bring it to you guys and you know well, find you did out. the right thing <laughs> and of course this is like one vertebra out of i suppose 70 or so that would make it a 60 foot archaeocete whale wes tell me what we're going to see today on our dive well we're going to go on an introductory cave dive a trip into the daylight zone of an underwater cave, which is called a cavern. And this is a place where y'all can relax and enjoy that world without going where you need special training and equipment. You guys ready to go on a cavern dive? Yeah. All ready. Y'all ready? Oh. Nothing can quite prepare you for the experience of diving in these magical pools of light. And what looks like just a little shallow pond from the surface um, just opens up and reveals itself to be this magical, deep, complex place underneath the surface. Springs offer a real myriad experience for, for snorkelers, for scuba divers, for cave divers. It doesn't matter what your level of experience is, you can enjoy these places. And the discoveries and, and the connection we make with our past by, by exploring that with the museum is, is something that's extremely enriching. Beginning here at the Florida Museum of Natural History, they can get a broad orientation to many of the fundamental aspects that color everything you see in Florida.
exploration on Earth is pretty much done in the sense that we've seen almost every corner of the planet, but there does remain one area of the planet unexplored, and that's the deep underwater cave systems. And here in North Florida, we have one of the largest labyrinth of unexplored cave systems on Earth. You know, we've explored hundreds of miles underwater, underground, and we haven't even gotten to the tip of the iceberg. Funding for Expedition Florida Wild Alachua was provided by a grant from the Alachua County Visitors and Convention Bureau, home to the University of Florida, where the pristine beauty of old Florida and the space age knowledge of the 21st century meet. Additional support was provided by Forever Florida and Florida Echo Safaris, offering visitors guided nature tours on comfortable coaches or horseback. Forever Florida's mission is to preserve our unique wilderness habitats and natural beauty and by G. Coffrin.